everybody to today's webinar. We're thrilled to have you all with us. Um, the topic of today's webinar is supporting employment and education for people with psychosis challenges with Rona Unger, who's probably a familiar face to a lot of you if you've been involved in ISPS US for a while or if you've attended any of our webinars. I'm Leah Giorgini, and if you haven't seen me yet, I'm Executive Director of ISPS US, been in position since March, and I'm really interested and passionate about this topic. Not only was I a young person, um, and my first episode of psychosis definitely interrupted my education, but I later went in to work as an occupational therapist and did some vocational rehabilitation work myself with folks. Um, so I'm thrilled that Ron is bringing his very um, holistic perspective to this topic. Um, and let me introduce him to you if you don't know him already. So Ron Unger is a therapist and educator specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis, uh, a facilitator for the Hearing Voices Group and a supervisor for a peer specialist team. His work is informed by personal and family experiences of psychosis. As I've said, he chairs the Education Committee of ISPS US and blogs at recoveryfrompsychosis.org. I'm sure he'll introduce himself further. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Ron. Well, welcome everybody. I, yeah, a lot of the ideas I'll be talking about today come from my background in cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis and also from the Hearing Voices Network, which has developed a lot of ideas and shared them around the world. Um, and these are things that I think um, people can find helpful, even if they aren't trained as a therapist or um and that, that sort of thing has been found um, that ideas, for example, from CBT can be used by non-therapists, uh, especially the ones that I'll be talking about today. Um, and I know that a lot of you here already are kind of like trained as employment sp specialists, supportive employment specialists. And um, I'm not actually trained in that. I'm trained as a therapist. But I, of course, supporting people on employment is also part of what therapists do. So um, whether you work as a specialist or, or not, I think knowing something about how to support employment is important. And then I, I, the way this talk came about is I was invited by a bunch of supported employment and education specialists to give a talk about psychosis in particular, because often those specialists found that working with people with psychosis was harder or they got more confused doing it than they did with people with other kinds of mental health challenges. And the talk was well received. So I thought, why not offer it to a wider audience? Um, yeah. So, you know, to get started, we might talk about like, well, what is, you know, why support employment and education? And the key thing is just helping people move towards the life they want. And there's this idea that moving towards a desired life is more effective than trying to reduce symptoms anyway. Um, because sometimes, for example, what is a symptom um, changes as once somebody finds that they can move their life forward while hearing a voice, for example, they might not even care that they're hearing a voice anymore. The main thing is to get their life moving in a way that makes sense. Um, and supportive employment, as of course all of you who work in the field know, it's an evidence-based approach. You know, like you know, there's dozens of studies that can show that that's true. Um, for those of you who don't know, I want to make a distinction between supportive employment and the earlier idea of a sheltered work environment. Because a sheltered work environment is about let's modify the workplace so that um, you know people with a mental health challenge can can work there um but supported employment is more like well let's support the person so they can just go work in an everyday work environment um and and, and so it's not like a special sheltered thing though i do think there's you know some arguments can be made for trying to you know encourage people to modify a workplace to make it a little more friendly towards people that that may have a few challenges. And we'll talk about that in terms of schools and education in a little bit. Um, so the key thing, I, I took this slide from somebody who spoke at our recent ISPS US conference that happened in Sacramento. 
But Jennifer Gerlach had this as part of her presentation, and it's about her own experience. And she wrote that some of the most helpful things that treatment providers did for her were helping her apply to college and just talking about the future, like she was just any other kid. And at the time, she imagined a life as a therapist and speaker and writer, and and it's come true. <laughs> She's been free of the hospital, as she said, for 18 years and counting. So this stuff is just really important. It can be the most crucial thing that happens to somebody. Um, and again, it's a lot of it is just the normal thing. Hey, this person may have some troubles with psychosis, but what about their future? <laughs> what do they want for themselves? Just help them move forward. And that might be the most important thing you can do. Um, well, let's step back and, and think about you know, what is psychosis? And um, one kind of like quick definition is that it's a some combination of being, you know, especially disorganized and being out of touch with reality. So that brings up a question. How many of you are completely organized and completely in touch with reality? I encourage you, if you are, just type I am into the chat. Um, yeah, if you're completely organized and completely in touch with reality. Um, yeah, I'm not, not seeing people make that claim. Um, <laughs> so, so, sometimes, um, if, if anybody does make the claim, I just say, well, there's a, somebody with a grandiose delusion. Um, but one idea from, a key idea, I think, from CBT for psychosis is that it's psychosis is on a continuum with normal human difficulties. It's just when they get too severe, we draw a line and say, that's psychotic. Um, that's why some use the term extreme states instead of psychosis. It conveys this idea that it's about extreme versions of states of mind and reactions to problems that are common to humanity. So a few important things to realize. Um, one is that there's many ways to be what gets called psychotic, and some ways are more severe than others. Um, and also people move along a continuum over time, including to where they recover and are no longer what you could call psychotic any, at, at all. Um, for example, I know a lot of very competent professional people who were once diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, interestingly, research shows that people are much more likely to recover in parts of the world where they don't receive that much psychiatry. And some reason, one, one reason that people think that is true is that these are often areas where you know, the, the community needs everybody to pitch in and, and, and work. So instead of thinking people can't work, they're more likely to say, well, what kind of work can this person do? And then get, help them get busy doing that. And later the person might recover and become able to do much more. But just the process of getting engaged and involved is helpful. And something like that happened to this guy I know. His name is Ron Bassman. He's public about his story, so I can share it. But he had a second psychotic episode after he'd already gone to work in a mental hospital as a psychologist. And now once he was no longer so psychotic, he tried to go back, back to work, but he found he wasn't mentally able to do his regular job. Now, fortunately, instead of firing him, they just figured out, well, what kind of stuff can he do? And got him busy doing that. And, you know, so he got busy doing that. And then after a while, was able to do more. And then he went back to his regular job and then he advanced and later he was head of a mental health agency and later directed a nonprofit and all this sort of thing. So in, in, in doing supportive employment, you can help people move along this continuum towards recovery and being in charge of their lives. And just holding the hope that they can possibly do that is, is, is one important intervention, just holding that hope. Um, so one of the um, key ideas in CBT for psychosis is something called normalizing. And, um, and it's very related to this, this idea that psychosis is just on a continuum with normal states of mind. Um, and just where things get a little more extreme. Now you might think, well, not everybody has paranoia and delusions, um, but, 
it's it's helpful to, to question that. So I'm encouraging you to fill out this poll, this poll quickly. Um, so if you could just check off, want to see where people are at on it. Uh, at least get to work more than half of them. All right, I didn't see, everybody hadn't had a chance to answer, but I'll go on. Just as you can see, um, there's a lot of people that had um, a lot of these experiences. And, um, and just something like feeling your phone vibrate when it's actually not vibrating is a tactile hallucination, <laughs> to use the, 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 that technical term, as it were. Um, and, you know, we all sometimes have um, mistaken beliefs. We get suspicious or paranoid. Um, you know, like when you get some of these texts or emails that want your login information, a little paranoia is actually kind of helpful. Um, so, you know, you might not have had experiences that are extreme enough that somebody might call them psychosis, but just you know, talking to people, when we talk to people about our own weird experiences or paranoid thoughts or whatever, it can help people see themselves that the stuff is human. And, and then they have more hope for themselves. They might have got a little carried away with something, but they can tone it down and, and join, you know, join the rest of humanity. Um, and, and, and also normalizing, part of it is noticing how common a lot of the experiences associated with psychosis are like hearing voices, you know, research has shown that maybe about 10% of people will at some point in their life experience a significant episode of, of voice hearing. Um, and, and many of those will get through it without any needing any kind of mental health assistance. Um, also, it can help to see how even something that looks kind of like a kind of bizarre psychotic concern might have its root in just really normal human concerns. So maybe the person is sometimes believing that their coworkers are plotting about how to do them in. Now, if we consider this, well, at its root, this might be about feeling insecure and unsure about how to relate to their coworkers, which is really common, especially when people have been isolated or have had past trauma. As many people with psychosis have had past trauma. Then we might not be as intimidated about how to work with it, and we might end up being more effective. Um, now, I want to just show a short video that was produced by people in the, the hearing voices movement, basically. Um, and um, it's just about um, the experience of hearing voices and how it's and how to support people in the education system who do hear voices and see if you can't see in this some some kind of like normalizing kind of stuff being discussed. And also you'll see in the, in the earlier part of it, you'll see some people doing what we might call abnormalizing, which tends not to be helpful, making people feel they're more abnormal. Students like us who hear voices or see visions are, like any other student, full of potential. And some of our skills can come from our experiences of hearing or seeing things. Like me, I can think outside the box and I know we can't take things at face value. I'm great with focusing and multitasking. I've heard voices for a long time and I've had to ignore them in order to study. And even when we're struggling, it's important to keep in mind that our abilities enabled us to get a place at university in the first place. For some of us, our voices can also be a positive force in our lives. The reasonable adjustments and support that you offer can help us overcome these challenges and complete our course. So in my case, I can find it quite difficult navigating university life alongside my voices. They can make me feel terrible. Everyone's looking at you here. 
You're so stupid. We're now going to look at sensory perceptions and focus on an example of auditory hallucinations in patients with schizophrenia. They're all looking at you. You're so dumb. You're so stupid. They're all laughing at you. They're all laughing at you. It's difficult enough without having to deal with the stigma from other people. I've also had some tough experiences recently. Ha <laughs> ha! You can't even call people on the phone. You're so useless. You are pathetic. Attendance levels are unacceptable. If they don't improve, there will be sanctions. Alex has failed to inform me of any mitigating circumstances. I think you need to suspend your studies. If you're hearing voices, you just can't be well enough. I can manage my voices when I am fully supported. Could I try? I don't like your tone. You are sounding very aggressive. Exam situations are the worst for me. Okay, you have three hours for this exam and your time begins now. All of these responses can be really unhelpful. They not only feed into stigma around our experiences, but also create extra barriers for us to navigate when systems and institutions can already feel intimidating or exclusionary. Sometimes systemic changes are needed, but often it can be the simple or everyday things that you, as university staff, can do that will really help us. Sensing things that others can't is a common human experience. How many of you have heard someone call your name when no one did? Or felt a bug crawling on your skin when nothing was there? We're all sensory beings, but some people have sensory experiences they find overwhelming or distressing. We'll share some resources about this on the student platform. How are you feeling today? Just checking in as I haven't seen you at lectures or seminars in a while. It would be great if we could arrange a one-to-one -one chat to see how we can support you. Sure, a break from studies is one option, but you can also try blended learning or get support from the counselling service, the students union or disability services. How can we help? What do you need from us? In today's exam, you'll be permitted extra time and we've built in some breaks for you. There are lots of ways to understand hearing voices. Try to be kind instead of fearing us, and talk to us about them. Many of us have experiences of being dismissed, misunderstood, and marginalized. Try to believe and respect us, and we can figure out together how to thrive at uni. If we fall off the radar, please don't let us fall through the cracks. We have so much to offer, but sometimes we just need the chance to show it. For more information, please visit www.voicecollective.co.uk. Right. So, um, so yeah. So that hopefully gives you some ideas about how some people that hear voices think they, um, what kind of perspectives and approaches might be be helpful and it's important to think about. Um, so. Um, one thing I think that's helpful to think about is that, you know, like I, I said earlier, I think psychosis covers a broad range of experiences. Um, and it's important to individualize what you're doing to the person you're working with. Um, and collaborating on, you know, like focusing on problems that they also see as problems. Because, you know, it's really important not to decide what someone's problem is and jump in and try to fix it, but be working on things together. Um, so try to get a joint understanding. Um, and um, a, a, a big reason why, you know, people often go off track when they're trying to help someone with psychosis is that the, the helper gets an idea of what the problem is that's different than the person um, that they're trying to help has. And so they're actually clashing. And so we want to, we want to be collaborative. That's, that's, really key working together in a friendly way and that can be tricky of course to develop a joint understanding and collaborative relationship with somebody who sees the world way differently than you do um, but a key thing is you want to avoid any kind of butting heads about beliefs um, and that doesn't work with people with psychosis but actually it's been found not to work with anybody that holds a strongly held belief They've even done brain studies where they show that if you directly challenge somebody's strongly held belief, 
the areas of the brain that are responsible for reason and logic start shutting down while fight or flight gets activated, which is, you know, not, in other words, people get less reasonable instead of more as, as you confront them. So, so what works better? Well, one, one thing that sometimes just looking at the consequences of beliefs and helping people see that their belief is in some sense the link to the trouble they're having. And just noticing that link then sometimes gets people interested in maybe experimenting with looking at things differently, uh, you know, because they want a different consequence. So maybe they want to keep their job, so they're willing to consider, you know, entertaining beliefs that might help them do that. Um, so talk about that a little bit. Um, so one issue is that often people aren't even aware that their beliefs are playing a role. So they might just say, well, I hear the voices of my coworkers saying terrible things. Um, and then I lose my temper with them and yell at them, or I just stay home. And, you know, that's just what happens. Um, so one idea is just to notice that there is this belief that's playing a role. Um, and CBT, we call this an ABC formulation, but, um, of course, you don't have to use that, that term. It's just noticing the role of the belief. But then they can think of like, well, what if you experimented telling yourself something else? Like, for example, what if you just thought, maybe I'm hearing this because, you know, I'm really worried that my coworkers are um, thinking those things and, and, and are going to say those things. And so I'm you know, wor so worried about it that I'm hearing it like a, a voice. So maybe my coworkers don't really think that. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's not really them talking. Maybe it's just voices. And then maybe you can keep working. And of course, once you keep working, you might start trusting your coworkers a little better. And then eventually the whole thing might, might you know, simmer down. Um, so that's, um, you know, sometimes though, even though people are aware of the negative consequences of a belief, they they won't be able or willing to let go of it. But then, you know, there might be other things you can do though. Like, you know, how can they, you know, maybe can how how might they continue at the job even though they hold this disruptive belief? For example, what might the person who hears the voices that seem to be of coworkers saying critical things about them, you know, do to succeed. You know, or one option might be to just accept, well, maybe I've got critical coworkers who make critical remarks, but maybe instead of getting all upset about it, I can just commit to doing a good job um, and consider that my coworkers might change their views over time as they see you doing decent work and, and make sure that you're not responding to criticism that you know you're not hearing directly from somebody in other words if you think you're hearing the coworker in the other room say critical things about you don't respond to that but only respond if they say it to your face um and that kind of strategy might also allow somebody to continue working um uh, now another thing is is like sometimes like well if the coworker did come up and say something critical does the person feel like they could respond in an assertive and respectful way? In other words, not yelling back at the person or not collapsing and being really passive, but just having an assertive conversation uh, uh, um, or you care about what the other person is saying, but also speak for yourself in a self-respecting way. Now, one of the interesting things is that people that have trouble with with voices often also um, have trouble, um, you know, doing this, responding to other people, actual other people in an assertive and self-respectful way. Um, people, um, and, and, and when people can learn to be assertive, just let's say with other people, that often helps them with their voices as well. So, um, so this is something that you might end up like if, if a person fears um, negative things being said about themselves by others or even hears voices of people saying negative things, helping the person imagine how they would stand up to an actual person 
telling them that and, and is is something you can practice just you know practicing good human interactions or thinking about it so they might you know um let's say so say the person has a fear of somebody coming up to them and saying something like that you're a psycho and you shouldn't be working here um I mean, you could start, sometimes you could start by yourself role-playing being them and how you might respond. You know, you could, you know, sort of the, the accuser is saying, you're a psycho, you shouldn't work, be working here. And you might respond by, wow, it, it sounds like you're worried I might be dangerous or something. I can talk to you more about your worries if you want. But I think as you get to know me better, you'll find out that I'm an okay person. And so initially, you're just kind of showing them that it's possible to respond in a calm, assertive way. But then it's having them practice. Um, first, just imagining themselves do it, and then actually, you know, doing it, and play around with role plays. I know you might already be doing this in supportive employment, doing role plays like in job interviews or something like that. But, um, you know, the same kind of thing, how they might respond to um, an accusatory or negative person is something that can be helpful for people. Um, so a few, a few other things about assertiveness. It's really important not to confuse assertiveness with being aggressive um, um, because it, it's, it's not. <laughs> now, one reason people are often scared of interaction with others and with voices because they worry they're going to get triggered to get aggressive and then do or say something they regret. Um, but when people know how to stick up for themselves without aggression, that fear goes down. They fear, oh, I could handle it if somebody did make an accusation. I wouldn't have to get aggressive. I can just you know, calmly stick up for themselves. Um, another part of assertiveness is knowing how to end conversations, um, you know, how to, you know, sometimes just agree to disagree. <laughs> Uh, well, we can't resolve that right now, but you can leave it here <laughs> or something like that. Knowing um, how the conversations can be ended actually helps people be less scared of them. Um, you don't have to necessarily try to resolve everything in the conversation. Um, so, so, so people feel safer when they feel like they, they can handle conversations. They can handle talking about about stuff and and that feeling safe is really central to what we're talking about with with psychosis because um you know one thing we found is that that um often yeah the core of psychosis is people feeling unsafe and the flip side is whatever we can do to help people feel safer tends to reduce psychosis um and that's what they focused on and what's really the most um, successful psychological approach to psychosis so far, um, which was called the Feeling Safe Program. And what they did is, is, is figured out some key problem areas um, that can cause people um, to feel unsafe. And, and they didn't work on what they saw as the, the, the paranoid delusion or whatever. But instead, they worked on these, these outer areas. And um, so it was things like help the person handle worry better, help the person have fewer negative beliefs about themselves that um, help themselves feel able to handle voices and other experiences or sleep better or um, do fewer what they call defense behaviors. I should just probably explain that. Um, that's things people do to try to defend themselves, but that may actually make things worse. And it also keeps them from finding out they don't have to do it. So some examples might be maybe the person um, never really looks at people very much because if they're afraid, if they look at people, they'll see signs of rejection. Um, but then because they never look at people, they're never tuned into what people are actually thinking and feeling and or when they're being accepted. <laughs> um, so actually getting the person to practice actually looking. Um, or they might have a belief that, you know, like, they're in danger when they're in public, so they try to rush through it as quick as they can, and 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 sort of like, um, but dropping that would mean maybe going to the store and actually shopping very slowly and kind of meandering and showing themselves that hey, actually this is a safe place and I can be safe here. 
Um, so getting people to try doing what they're scared of doing is, is kind of like a key approach there. Um, but it can help people make big shifts. You know, they might first can have them just imagine doing it, have them imagine going to that social situation and, um, and you know, um, just meander rather than rush through it uh, or look at people rather than, than not. Now, if you had um, uh, virtual reality equipment, they're actually finding that it can be really helpful to help people work through this in virtual reality, um, where they see themselves going into a shop, let's say, and, and interacting. Um, but you can, you know, we can do it with imagination and role play instead. Um, and then eventually, it can be going with them, maybe while they practice some of this stuff out in public uh, can be a helpful thing to do. So um, the previous slide showed that one of the areas in the feeling safe program address was worry. And you might kind of like wonder, well, what does that have to do with delusions and psychosis? But one way of thinking about it is that, you know, what we call delusions happen when people aren't handling worries and uncertainty very well. Um, so one thing people do is when people are can't stand being uncertain about possible threats. They may just decide that it's true. You know, instead of they're worrying their coworkers want to get them fired, they just decide it's true. Or, or that the voice they hear is the coworker that wants to get them fired. So, you know, they feel better in the sense that their uncertainty and worry is gone, but now they have a fixed delusional belief. But underneath, it's really just a worry. So when people have better skills for handling uncertainty and worry, then they can often reframe that. Oh, I'm worried maybe my coworkers want to get me fired, but maybe they don't. Or maybe if I do a good job, they won't want me to. Um, so, um, so yeah, so when people are doing poorly with worry, um, they're either maybe trying to avoid, trying to think about what might go wrong, or they're thinking about it all the time. Um, and, and both of those can be, you know, often um, not that helpful. Also, I want to say something about the connection between worry and like hearing voices and that kind of thing. Um, I was just working with a guy recently who, you know, reported that his coworkers were pressuring him inside of his mind. Um, but as we explored that, he could kind of see that the coworkers he experienced in his mind were actually more negative than his, you know, coworkers, the things they actually said to him face to face. And so, you know, we talked about that. Well, maybe this is your mind worrying that the coworkers, um, you know, have these negative attitudes. Maybe you could play around with it, though, and imagine like what your coworkers would actually more likely say to you if they were really talking to you. Um, and, you know, try that a little bit. And then he also sort of like um, realized that, well, maybe one reason why he was imagining his coworkers putting all this pressure on him is that sometimes he would shirk his duties and not do what he was supposed to do. And so maybe part of him thought he had to, to um, you know, create a lot of pressure in his mind to try to make him do the right thing. So as he was more able to think of it, well, maybe this is me pressuring myself, then he was able to um, say, well, maybe I just need to pressure myself enough to get going and then back off on the pressure. So it's, anyway, that also kind of relates to worry. Hopefully that's it. But a key intervention for worry, I'll just go over this pretty quick. Um, and CBT is to try to turn towards worry some of the time and then other times just, you know, let go of it and focus on, um, you know, getting on with things. So um, a key idea is that a little worry goes a long way. Um, you know, so, so one way to do this is to just set a time where, where they practice facing their worries, let's say 15 minutes or so, and actually use a timer so you don't go so long. Um, and, you know, during that time when you're deliberately worrying, you face your thoughts about what might go wrong and consider what to do about them. 
you know, you might come up with a plan to get more fats or to talk to people or actions to reduce threats. And, and just sometimes just acknowledging, accepting certain risks can't be controlled. But then when worry time ends, shift to, you know, doing things. Some of it might be carrying out plans you made during worry time or just working on other goals. And if more stuff comes up to worry about, oh, I can worry about that tomorrow when I set a time for worries. So that way you just make a practice of not um, having your whole life be filled with worrying or not have your whole life be filled with trying to evade worries. Instead, it's sometimes towards them, sometimes turning away. Um, so, you know, once people have practiced deliberately turning towards worries and then deliberately turning away, they often get a lot better at handling it and, and, a lot, and don't need to set a formal time eventually. Um, so these, you know, are just things that, that might be helpful. Um, you know, a few other areas. Um, one is um, sleep. You know, obviously, if your people are sleeping horribly and really irregular schedules, that can make it hard to work. Um, and as well as the poor sleep can contribute to mental health problems. So in working with that, you know, I mean, one thing that helps is just try to understand what the person's current pattern is and where it kind of like goes way off track and from what's helpful and then help them think of shifts they might be able to make. Um, you know, CBT for insomnia is a whole field of study like the slide says. And by, by the way, um, I'm going to um, have Leah mail out to you a copy of these slides and a copy of um, a resource sheet um, for, for this talk so that um, you don't have to write everything down. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, you know, lots can be, you know, worked on about how to help people sleep better and it can really help improve mental health. And another area is just people having low confidence in themselves, lack of self-confidence. And that can have a variety of reasons, you know, so, some of it might have preceded the psychosis, you know, things in their life that made them feel less self-confidence and that helped them be less stable, which helped them head into the psychosis. Now, some things might be because of things that happened, um, you know, during the time when they were psychotic, that can really shake people's confidence. And some may be caused by the mental health system that too often focuses on labels and deficits. So, you know, um, earlier we talked about helping people see they can be assertive with other people or with voices. Um, but being assertive is hard when we worry about the truth about ourselves might be that we're worthless or horrible. So that's where helping people identify strengths and positive qualities about themselves comes in. You know, I, I think that's something we can be paying attention to all the time when we're interacting with people we're trying to help, just helping them notice that they do have strengths on the positive side. <laughs> um, but you can, we can also do specific exercises to help people identify strengths. So in that um, list of resources, I'm going to include this worksheet. You see part of it here, which just looks at, well, here's a bunch of things that people often think of as positive. Maybe we can check off the ones that you feel like you already have. And then maybe some of the other ones you might notice you're working on, but you're not quite there yet. And then maybe other ones aren't that important to you. And often you go through this with people that even that feel pretty bad about themselves and they notice, hey, they can actually check off quite a few of them. Um, and, you know, so that can, yeah, I can't, that's one thing that can be really helpful. And then you can kind of help them remember that. And the more they have the sense that, hey, maybe I'm an okay person. I might have lots of things that have gone wrong in my life, but I also have some good qualities. And, you know, hey, that's part of being human. We have those ups and downs. Um, I also want to say something about how to help people not be stuck in the past. Um, now, often people with psychosis have had traumatic pasts. Um, for example, a lot of research indicates that trauma can be a cause of psychosis later. And um, also psychosis may cause people to believe they've had horrible things happen to them, even when they didn't. 
And um, and often objectively horrible things do happen to people while they're psychotic as well. Um, so, so trauma has often played a big role. Um, but, but some people think that if trauma is an issue for somebody, then they need to focus on the past. Um, and that can be helpful sometimes for people who might benefit, you know, for example, seeing a therapist who does help them, you know, with trauma focused therapy. Um, but of course, that's not the focus and supportive of employment. Um, and, and people often can make a lot of progress um, with approaches that don't address the past. So, it, you know, it's not that you always need to address the past. Um, but instead, just focus on ways to feel safe enough now. Um, you know, and a lot of that includes helping people consider that the present may be different from the past. You know, and so examples might be a person believes they lost some past jobs due to persecution and bullying. Um, you may not even know if that was, were they really bullied or was it just paranoia? But without getting digging into that, you can, you can just suggest, well, maybe the new job will be different. Let's work on making sense of what you're seeing now on the job and, 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 and try to make sense of that evidence in a non-paranoid manner. Um, another example might be a person believes they can't face others because they think that the others have probably heard horrible things about them. Um, and someone with that kind of belief, um, I might talk about how celebrities often have to deal with people spreading horrible stories about them, right? And what works? Well, often it's just holding your head up. You don't know if the person heard the gossip or not, but just, you know, what you know is that you're, you're a person of some value and you have a reason to be there. And, you know, if they deliver, if they confront you face to face, hey, I heard that you blah, blah, blah. Well, then it's good to be able to imagine, you know, facing that directly. And, um, and, and how would you face that in an assertive way so you could help them with that kind of role play, but also realize that they don't have to, um, you know, they don't have to know whether other people heard bad things about them, because that is part of the thing. I mean, you know, we don't often know what other people know about us, but we can still treat ourselves in a self-respecting way and go about in the world. Um, um, here's another example. A person believes they can't function on the job because their brain's been damaged. Um, and that could be, maybe they have a psychotic story of how their brain got damaged, like that the aliens were experimenting on them. Or maybe it's a belief they picked up in the mental health system where somebody maybe convinced them that they have a brain illness that, um, you know, many people, for example, we report being told that their schizophrenia diagnosis means they'll never be able to work again. Um, it's also possible even your client had actual brain damage, right? Um, but a key thing is like to suggest, well, maybe the brain damage wasn't as bad as you thought it was, or maybe the undamaged areas of your brain are learning to take over the job that the damaged part used to do, because that's what happens with actual brain damage, right? It's often other parts of the brain learn to take over. So you can encourage people to try things and experiment. Um, and that also relates to the, the whole issue of cognitive impairment, because um, often people you know, with psychosis have had some cognitive impairment. But if you remember the story of Ron Bassman, the psychologist who became psychotic while he was working in a psych psychiatric hospital and he was too impaired to do his full job when he went back to work, you know, they let him experiment with finding out, well, what parts of the job he could do. And as he did more, his abilities came back. And eventually he was able to do things like be director of an agency. But that's a common finding, actually, as people get more active and engaged, their abilities come back. So the cognitive impairments associated with psychosis are, you know, often not permanent at all. Um, you know. We are our executive director, and, and I noticed in advertising this particular webinar, she mentioned a time in her life when she was so confused she couldn't make it or figure out how to make it around campus. Um, but you know, now now she's good enough at getting around that she's uh, we chose her as our executive director, and she's doing a great job. So, um, yeah. So um, another thing that it can often help people is um, finding ways to talk about their past and, and 
and and and and their and their current mental health challenges, because often people are either afraid to talk at all, or they'll tend to say way too much to the wrong people. So so one strategy is helping people learn that they can summarize things in different ways to avoid sharing what isn't needed in a particular situation. For example, they're being asked to explain periods of time off work and. Sometimes it can just be a summary. Well, I had some challenges in my personal life that kept me from working during that time. Or even I had some health challenges, but I'm doing much better now and I've gotten the help I need. Um, or let's say maybe they're having, the problem is that when they're at work, sometimes they hear voices and get all confused and can't handle things. And, um, and if they tell their coworkers they're hearing voices, that maybe could cause their coworkers to freak out because often people don't understand hearing voices. So instead, they might learn to say things like, I'm pretty anxious right now. There's a lot I'm dealing with. I'll get back to you shortly. Um, and, you know, can role play handling different situations, being honest enough. Um, you can also, um, another challenge is, you know, when you're working with somebody that continues to have strong beliefs that others are unlikely to share. Um, but one key area is you can help the person notice which of their beliefs other people are unlikely to share. And then you can talk about strategies people can use when we have beliefs that others don't share, like religious or political views that are sharply different from the people around us. And obviously, one strategy is just not to bring them up and just to focus on areas of common interest um, and, and beliefs. Or just notice the parts of one's belief that are more likely to be accepted. For example, if they believe the government is plotting against them personally, they might recognize that, hey, other people might not be that willing to believe that, but they might be willing to believe there's something wrong with the government, <laughs> okay? Or that the government can be untrustworthy. Or if the person believes that aliens are playing a role in their, in their personal life, well, maybe just find people that, you know, are interested in talking about aliens or notice that people don't want to talk about aliens, maybe not keep talking about it. Um, so, so yeah. Um, and then what about uh, when people seem really shut down, they seem really uh, flat or, or demoralized, um, you know, what gets sometimes gets called negative symptoms of psychosis. And that's negative because something seems to be missing. Um, well, one thing we can understand is that people being shut down in that way can be an attempt to protect themselves. In fact, um, I, if I've got it right, we have uh, Pat Vegan as part of this webinar. Um, I was actually have her as part of this presentation as well. because She is a well-known psychologist now, but as a young person, she was hospitalized and diagnosed with schizophrenia. And when she got out, she was just sitting on the house, smoking cigarettes and drinking coats. But um, she, this is the quote I wanted to read. And, and um, it's, they blamed it on our illness, but they don't understand that giving up is highly motivated, highly goal-directed behavior. For us, giving up was a way of surviving. Giving up, refusing to hope, not trying, not caring. All of these were ways to try and protect the last fragile traces of our spirit and our selfhood from undergoing another crushing. Um, so people can be giving up because they're afraid of trying again and getting just battered down. So what helps is general invitations um, to, to try things. And, and practicing trying things, but not trying too hard. That's a, kind of a CBT slogan, try, but don't try too hard. Um, like when her grandma invited her to go to the store, so push the cart for her. Okay, that's a very simple job, but just getting going on that was a big thing. Um, you know, and yeah, so there's something on the, that part of it. And I want to say a little bit about medications. One thing I assume is everybody's familiar with the problem of people suddenly quitting their medications and becoming unstable and relapsing and everything falling apart. And it's often thought that this means our role should be to tell people that they need to stay on their medication. They need to be compliant. 
Um, but there's just a few problems with that. One is that people often feel trapped on the medications. They might have both unpleasant subjective effects and, and maybe side effects that are actually damaging their, their physical health. And when people feel trapped, they can get into, um, you know, fight or flight mode. And that can lead to actually suddenly rebelling and, and quitting the drugs. Um, another problem is that we can't know for sure that someone should stay on these drugs forever. Um, lots of people do get successfully get off. And some studies indicate that people who get off the medications are more likely to recover and be able to work and go to school. So instead, we can take the position of not knowing what's, what the person needs regarding long-term medication. But we can also take a position backed by research that making small changes in medication or slowly tapering is usually quicker than, than quitting suddenly. And then if people are upset with their medications, we can encourage them to make thoughtful decisions, talk with their prescriber, make changes cautiously. If you go down and it's not working, you can possibly go back up. Then they're less likely to be trapped and less likely to make sudden changes that could be detrimental. Um, and that does require being able to um, do assertive communication with the prescriber. But again, that's something else in practice. Them, these assertive communication skills are great on the job, but they also help talk to your prescriber or help you deal with voices. There's all sorts of reasons why it's important. Um, so a lot of this stuff um, will probably come up that people are talking about this beyond your you know, um, what you know how to help people with. But there are some important things you can do. You know, one is just encourage them to believe that a solution can be found, even if you don't know what it is right away. And, and encourage people to look in a variety of directions, not just to look at medications and psychiatry to answer everything, but also, you know, encourage them to go see a therapist. Encourage them to reach out for more support from family and friends. Change any changes towards a healthier lifestyle, peer groups and peer support, like hearing voices groups, and also educating themselves, like self help approaches. Um, Dan, Daniel Fisher is, uh, you know, a psychiatrist who did have a five period, five year period as a schizophrenia patient. And he wrote this book, Heartbeats of Help, of Heartbeats of Hope, um, about a whole variety of things that helped him recover. And, you know, so some people are, you know, open to reading and, um, you know, learning what, what can help that way. Um, I could just tell one quick story um, about how reading can be helpful. <laughs> um, I was seeing this guy who was just starting to go back to school after a psychotic episode. And he called me and said he was having big trouble. He was starting to have unwanted racist thoughts while he was in class. And then he started worrying that everyone could read his thoughts. And that made him scared to stay in class because they would see that he was a racist and it would be terrible. Now, at that time, I was going out of town and I couldn't schedule a session for a couple of weeks. And so what I did is just suggest that he read this book called The Imp of the Mind, which is about how to handle unwanted thoughts because he was having unwanted racist thoughts. And when I did finally manage to meet with him a couple weeks later, he had read the book. And based on what he read, he was no longer worried about his unwanted thoughts. And so he wanted to talk about other issues at that point. So just the book itself. Um, so again, the handout I'm going to get sent out there is a, a few books I think are especially helpful for people who are willing to read, which of course is just some people. <laughs> um, so bigger issue is what we're doing is trying to help people change their story. Now, a lot's been said about stigma, but an ongoing problem is that much of what we call stigma actually comes directly from the mental health system. Um, Oryx Cohen, when he was first diagnosed with psychosis, found that the way professionals talked to him about what had happened made him feel like he'd lost his membership in the human race. You know, they were basically teaching him he had a brain illness and he'd always have to take this medication. But fortunately, he did find good help. And now he's chief executive officer of the National Empowerment Center. He's married with kids and, you know, does not rely on the drugs and all that. Um, 
So people with psychosis, they often do get in a lot of trouble with what we, we might call their psychotic story or psychotic perspective that they you know, believe there's important emotional reasons why they believe it, but it gets them in trouble. So we often, um, you know, think that we can pull them out of that by convincing of them a psychiatric story instead. Oh, no, what you're believing isn't true. That's just caused by your illness, which is schizophrenia or, you know, whatever, psychotic disorder. Um, and that solves one kind of problem, but it causes other problems. It's going kind of from one extreme to another. I was at a Hearing Voices Congress once, and and this woman said that thinking to shifting to your problems, shifting to thinking about your problems in diagnostic terms often does bring relief. But she said it's the kind of relief you get when you pee your pants. It solves one kind of problem, but now you've got a new problem. You know, you're... Um, seeing yourself as a, as a mental patient. So what we're really interested in is something more in the middle, which is where people see themselves as evolving and their story can evolve. They can, you know, maybe part of my story isn't quite right. I can work on shifting it, I can work on doing things differently. Um, a better approach is just to see that you know, life is tricky, our minds are tricky, reality and social reality is tricky. We might be making mistakes at various points, but we can keep working on it, keep figuring it out. We're evolving beings with evolving minds. Um, so a, a lot of what we're doing is help people regain control over their story. I really like this Salmon Rushdie quote, those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, rethink it, deconstruct it, and joke about it, and change it as times change, truly are powerless. Um, and it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, people may need to change the stories they tell themselves just so that they can organize themselves to go to, uh, and try out school or work. But also when they do, um, you know, try out school and work and, and have some success, they're changing their story, right? They're contradicting stories that might have been told about their lack of value or their lack of competence. Um it's interesting that a lot of people have said that overcoming the stigma and low expectations around experiences like psychosis was more difficult than overcoming the psychosis itself. You know, for one thing, there's a sense um, that a person once diagnosed will always be seen in some sense as less than, less stable, and less competent than those that haven't been diagnosed. But an alternative idea is that that some would call post-psychotic growth. And that's the idea that at least for some people, having gone through an experience of psychosis and recovery can lead to them becoming stronger than they would be if they never had the problem. Um, it's at least something for people to consider. Um, so, you know, you might've noticed what I'm talking about is just the importance of believing that people can evolve and recover. And lots of people who have recovered said that meeting people who believe they could do it was one of the most important things in helping them do it. Um, and one thing that will help you believe that others can recover is just knowing other stories of people that have done it and keeping those stories in mind and being curious about how that kind of stuff is possible. Well, this stuff can be tricky and there's lots of things that can go wrong. Um, but it can also be very inspiring because when you do effectively help somebody who's been severely troubled, that can be a lot more rewarding than helping people whose problems are maybe less severe and much more easily solved. Um, so I, I think I've just got you started thinking maybe about what's possible, but I hope you keep curious and keep learning and discovering things. And um, yeah, so now we're open for some questions and discussion. Stop my share. Thank you so much, Ron. That was a great talk that covered so much ground. Um, and thanks for shouting out my story. Yeah, there was a time in my life where I was so confused and diagnosed with first episode psychosis that I couldn't remember what classroom classroom my, my class was. My sociology class actually was the one I can remember. Most particularly, I just couldn't find it. But I've been there like a hundred times. Um, fortunately, now I'm a little bit less confused. 
<laughs> I still get there sometimes, but I think it's probably on the, the normal spectrum now. Um, but yeah, just, just little things like that just really got in the way of me being able to pursue my education. So great that you're able to share some strategies and approaches and ways to understand these issues so that others can work through them too. All right, folks, looks like we have a few questions in the Q&A box, but feel free, you've probably had some time to think already about what Ron has said. Feel free to keep adding them to the Q&A box and then we'll get to them all. We'll start taking the questions now. Um, okay, Ron, so we have a participant called Matthew who's had a couple of really interesting questions. So let's kick it off with one of his. Is it okay or problematic to encourage a loved one with psychosis to work if they say that they don't want to work? And they are home isolated most of the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I was saying earlier, it's really important not to be trying to solve a problem that the other person doesn't think they have. So I would say first, tr try to find out what your loved one's um, sense of like what they see as problems in their life. And, um, and then you might, gradually like tune in to how maybe work would help solve some of those problems, but first get on the same page with them. So like, for example, sometimes people are bored, you know, and it's like, oh, boredom, what if you had more things to do? <laughs> you know, and, and, and that naturally leads to, well, maybe there'd be some advantages to, to work, but also be willing to talk about why they don't want to. Supportive employment has been found that most people, even with a diagnosis with schizophrenia, can work if they want to work. But if they haven't wanted to work yet, they're, you know, they're not going to do it. So sometimes, but it has to be step by step. So first, um, um, yeah, finding out what their actual, um, what they see as problems and what their values and goals are that they see as doable and, and then um, see how, um, once the person starts becoming more active with just simple things, simple little successes, then they might get interested in bigger things and, and try to do that without introducing a lot of stress and pressure, but kind of playfully and just opening up and not to, because remember stress is often like what's making the problem happen in the first place. So I hope that's at least part of an answer. It strikes me that that, that quote you read of, uh, of Pat's is quite, uh, relevant there too about um, that maybe withdrawing being a defense mechanism or a way of preserving dignity. Yeah, yeah. If you feel like you're just going to go to work and it's going to be a complete disaster, of course you're not going to want to try. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Matthew had another question. How similar or different are the set of interventions for supporting a person with psychosis versus mania? And yes, well, mania often, of course, can at its extreme become psychotic. So <laughs> they're often not two different things. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, um, I don't know, like with mania is an interesting thing because sometimes, um, May, may, people with mania are very productive <laughs> um, and of course and other times you know that they can be going off into um, trying things that are so unrealistic that are, everything's falling apart um, you know um, it can be hard to reach people that are really manic um, but often you know you have to kind of like um, hang in there with them and, and um, until they can calm down a bit and then start noticing, um, um, you know, that how the mania did lead to problems and how to, how to um, um, you know, avoid getting so revved up again in the, in the future. I don't know. I'm kind of wandering a little bit but it's it's kind of interesting about mania because we often like think that our goal is to feel good and then mania sometimes at least people feel really good um but the problem is of course sustainability you know and so helping people figure out well okay what's what's sustainable let's try to look at what the you know is really going to work for you in the longer term so. great great thank you 
Megan asks, would an approach for feeling safe in the present or future be understanding their triggers and how to calm themselves down in the moment? Well, yeah, I mean, like looking at um, the kind of things that they might find challenging and then how to handle those. Like I was talking about, like one thing obviously triggering is feeling like some kind of accusation. Like I used the example, you're psycho and shouldn't be working here. Well, but if you feel like you can calmly respond to that, then it's just not so threatening. Like, yeah, if anybody ever said that to me, I could I could think some. I, I'm, you know, I have an explanation. Well, now it's not so triggering. So yeah, that definitely is part of it. Great. Ruth asks, how does a person who has been a mental patient and who feels lonely make friends and find new connections when they have not developed that skill over many years? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, is, it is easier to help people who, who developed a lot of skills and then um, their skills collapse while they're psychotic, like, and, and, you know, than it is to help people that never developed the skills in the first place. <laughs> So it is more hard work, but I mean, often people actually did develop more skill than um, than they seem to have. Just like you know, somebody had met you while you were psychotic, and wow, she doesn't even know how to find her way around campus. She must not have skills. <laughs> well, that's not really what the problem. Was you had developed those skills, but there was so much going on in your mind, you just weren't able to engage those skills. So. Um, but but if the, the person really doesn't have the skills, it's often just saying, well, maybe you've got enough skills to just be a little friendly with people or just, just you know, in, so you look for little successes to build on them a little bit more, a little bit more, um, and, and you work with what the person seems capable of doing. Like I mentioned, Ron Bassman, to go back to work, they, well, that's the work that you can do and got them doing that, then gradually like started doing better or well, the same you might do socially like can you you know like just work on really simple things and have simple successes having successes is really important and so you create situations where there can be success and then really noticing the success because sometimes people will succeed but then they're really quickly but i should be doing so much more and they won't recognize the success at all so it's really important to have the success and notice the success hey that was you know, that was some value that was something positive there that's that's better than how you were doing last week or that's you know that's hey how can we have more of this that was fun you know absolutely there's something to be said too about engaging with peers and i, I don't mean anyone who's been a mental patient should only interact with mental patients of course that's not what I mean but there's something greatly enriching about meeting others who've been through similar situations which is probably the success of the hearing voices movement for instance and hearing voices group where people get to come together and, and share that experience and make connections mm -hmm. yeah and one of the things is if you feel like in order to be with people you have to kind of like hide part of yourself that can lead you to feel bad over time. I mean, it's a good skill to know how to hide part of yourself. If you know, for example, hey, if I tell these people I'm hearing voices, they'll freak out and they'll think I'm weird. Maybe I should hide it. But it's a lot easier to do that at some times. If at other times, you know, you can go to hearing voices group and talk to a bunch of people who understand and can relate to you and you can be really open. And then you go, well, the only reason I can't be open with these other people is because they got these weird prejudices, you know? And it's, it's much more, you start having the feeling that, hey, I'm actually okay, you know, though some people might judge me, but I'm actually okay. Absolutely. I notice we have a lot of people working in services here as employment specialists, and I would imagine that some of those folks might even have had lived experience themselves. Uh, and at least from my work, and you know, the work against stigma shows that if you're able to divulge and talk about your mental health experiences or experiences in the system, then that leads to lowering stigma. And if we're able to model that in the, in the workplace as uh, professionals, those of you who are professionals or peer workers or even friends, being able to say, yeah, I experienced that and be open about it. Um, 
that can that can really help someone feel able to reveal part of themselves too, if not now, then in the future. Mm-hmm. We yeah. have a and question from, um, oh, did you have yeah. something to say about that? Brothers? Yeah, I wanted just one thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and even if you've never had like something that crosses the line into what people would call psychotic, just talking about um, your own kind of like weird experiences or times when like we've all had times maybe when we were suspicious of somebody but it turned out maybe that oh things were fine or maybe there's times when we failed to be suspicious and later we, which we had been um you know and just talking about that that uncertainty and that we're all in it together you know it can really help people feel more human and and that's what really reduces stigma yeah absolutely we have a question from Pat, Pat Deegan. She says, over-medication can be disabling and make it nearly impossible to work. Yes, I was there. What can employment specialists do if they're seeing over-medication? Yeah, um, that's one. I mean, um, one is just ask the person if they, what they notice about it, you know, um, what's going on, you know, what do you think is causing that? Do you think... That could be the medication. Have you talked with your prescriber? You could have the person know, you know, hey, if you're on too much, that you can feel too shut down. It's hard to do anything. Um, you know, um, I think you don't want to rush in like, I know this is exactly what's going on because, you know, sometimes people, um, you know, like sometimes people will actually get more shut down when they 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 try quitting medication because they get so overwhelmed that they just shut down more and they were actually functioning better when they were taking the medication. So I'd say it's 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 there's a lot of unknowns in there. Um, you know, I myself am a believer that we should really be trying to minimize medication use and trying to make it as short term as possible. I and mean, it doesn't have great long term results, but it's you know, it's 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 also very individual, like um, that some, and it's tricky. You know, um, so I I can't come in and claim to know what's going to work for somebody, or especially what's going to work for them now. And you know, but but I can support them and, um, you know, starting to talk about it and think about it and then encourage them. Whatever you do, let's try to make thoughtful decisions and. Um, cautious so that's a few things pat i don't know if you want to share I, I, pat i think has stuff online about some of this you know as an expert in the field so um, yeah pat in. if you had any comments please feel free to uh to write in the chat or we can even can even turn your camera on real quick just let us know well while pat's thinking about that we'll move on to the next question this is a very good point I have heard that some clients feel that normalizing can be dismissive of very disabling symptoms. Is normalizing a helpful approach to psychosis when someone feels their symptoms are severe? Yeah, and actually in CBT, there's a slogan, normalize, but don't minimize. And it's sort of like, um, you know, it's normal that sometimes we go outdoors and we get cold but if you go out and you're in Alaska and it's 50 below zero it is definitely different than getting the chill when you go out and <laughs> in Florida and it's a chilly day <laughs> um so um so it may be a continuum but yeah some things are on pretty extreme ends and so you really want to recognize it when something is extreme but at the same time it may be on a continuum just like temperature is on a continuum you know like you know, maybe we can get things to where it's a bit warmer and you'll still have to face chilly days, but they won't be quite so extreme and they'll be easier to handle. And, and having that as opposed to a categorical difference, like, oh, I'm facing something that no one has experienced before. You know, well, it's probably a variation on it. It may be an extreme variation on it, but so normalize, but don't minimize is the slogan. <laughs> That's a great slogan. All right, um, another question is from anonymous uh, attendee, and it seems like they're asking advice about someone they care about. So I'll read it. I have a loved one that lives outdoors most of the time and is homeless due to choices about work and life. He eats from the garbage and struggles to maintain consistent relationships. He is a person who was not taught many life skills and dropped out of school early. 
I have been hoping we could attain a plan for disability payments, but getting a diagnosis or assessment is bringing up some challenges in that there is difficulty with trusting the medical community, as well as beliefs that he'll be in danger of being abused or ostracized in society or held against his will. I am wondering if you have any advice about where to begin in supporting this person with compassion and insight. And thank you for this helpful information. Yeah, it sounds like such a um, multi-problem situation. Um, and, you know, like I, I think tr trying to have an ind a, a individual relationship where you build trust of, of some kind um, and, of course, it's it's sad that the, the mental health system has been, in my sense, or in my belief, overly ready to to try coercive interventions. Um, that is the downside of that is it makes people like this scared to interact. Um, but um, maybe um, figuring out like where the person could interact with the mental health system, who in particular they might be able to talk to, and then really try to come up with a very clear idea of under what circumstances a coercive intervention would be applied and, and, and when it wouldn't. And, and if the person has enough trust of the person that they're relating to that's guiding them in that way, they might decide, or especially if you catch them in a good moment, because sometimes people, will go weeks or months and totally shutting out certain possibilities, but then something will happen and they'll, hey, maybe now I'm ready to open up or try that. So being attentive to those um, times when the person might be open for something, which you have to interact with it. But yeah, it sounds like a very tough, tricky situation, but that's a few ideas that I have that come to mind. Thank you. I also put a little link in the chat um, about SOAR. So for folks here who are from America, there's a program called SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access and Recovery called SOAR. So that this is a very practical advice. I mean, Ron was talking more about that relationship aspect, but if you are able to find a SOAR trained um, uh, person in maybe in a, in a in a homeless agency or a mental health agency, they're actually trained to um, go through an expedited process to help someone get on SSI or SSDI. Um, and I'm, I'm so trained myself. So if you, if you wanna to talk to me about that, can you shoot me an email after the webinar? But that website does explain a bit about that and that can alleviate some of the barriers you're, you're talking about in terms of them not trusting the medical providers or, or wanting to be, um, treated against their will. Um, it enables you to meet people where they're at. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, I think that's all of our questions. Just, I'm gonna just give it a second. If you have any more questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'm even watching the chat if you can't see the Q&A box. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, I mean, there's just so many things. Um, this is a very kind of like, complex field but the way i imagine it is like this 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 continuum thing we all have you know difficulties making sense of things but as our trust um goes down um you know it might be because of betrayal or various kinds or sometimes it's it's the, the mind gets busy exploring other possibilities like one thing when you were talking with Leah about having trouble getting around college, I remember times because I went through my own experiences as a younger person and never ended up in the mental health system, but definitely stuff that people would have called psychosis. Um, they were just, I, I was questioning things so much that, that, that any way of making sense, that there were so many way, possible ways of making sense of things. Once you ask too many questions and then it just becomes overwhelming. There's just an overwhelming possibilities. And then how do you track really simple stuff in the midst of this overwhelming possibility? Um, but, but and, and things can start seeming very tricky and we as helpers can get very confused ourselves. Like, oh my gosh, we're lost and confused. And unfortunately, one way people have um, 
tried to not be lost and confused is we've tried to oversimplify psychosis and say, well, the problem is just that you have a biological illness and you need to take this medication. And if you're having symptoms, you just need to go take more medication and that's it. Boom. <laughs> and it makes it very simple for us, but it is not that helpful for the person we're trying to help. So being more willing to say, well, this might be confusing right now, but you know, if we hang in there, we may find a way to make sense of it. You know, your dreams are still important. Let's look at maybe yes. just simple ways you can move towards those dreams. This is so important because, you know, work is a big piece of a person's life for, for many people's lives. Not, not everybody. It doesn't need to be. Um, but I remember as, you know, in that phase of my life we talked about, um, when I wasn't a, a locked ward for a period of time, I, I managed to get leave once a week to go to my part-time job at the convenience store. And that was a place where I could feel normal, like not like the mental patient, but as the store clerk. And that was really, really important to my recovery and identity that I wasn't just going to be a patient at that point. And, and that's uh, something I was able to build on to a career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a couple yeah. more questions have come through. Wonderful. We'll, we'll, we'll do these before, before we close. Anne asks, Got any advice for parents or family members to encourage healing in a loved one? Uh, could you say that again? Do you have any advice for parents or family members to encourage healing in loved ones? Yeah, um, you know, hopefully like, you know, any of the stuff that we talked about might be helpful. Um, you know, um, I think what you just said, Leah, about, um, how finding things you could do that helped you get out of the patient mode. So anything you can do with your loved one that helps them get out of the patient mode and acknowledge them and, and, and connect with them in ways that aren't, you know, and recovery oriented cognitive therapy, one way they help people get out of the patient mode is that they'll ask the person to help them with something. And whether it's, you know, um, Pat Deegan's grandmother asking her to push the cart in the store, or, or um, like in therapists will often like um, ask, let's say the person does nothing except sit around all day and, and look at YouTube videos. Well, ask the person, what are the coolest YouTube videos out there? And wh wh which one should I look at if I want something really, you know, like, and that person all of a sudden becomes instead of a patient, they become the expert. Oh, I'm an expert on YouTube videos and I can teach my therapist what the good videos are. And it's it's really connecting with just what you talked about and then help people expand on that. So you can do that in a family too. You just like, hey, how can I put this person in a mode where they're actually, you know, somebody that's contributing or helping me or, you know, so that it's they're not being treated as a patient. Yeah, great advice. All right. Um, okay. This person has a, a, a comment and, the, and a question. So they really appreciate this presentation and the humanity piece, true empathy and compassion and how people are approached. I know there's an ongoing movement and push to create this type of perspective within the system. How can we create this type of perspective that better influences policies and how people are treated? For example, further shift from a medical model and that people's recovery may or may not be, include a medication compliance. And they know it's a big question. So how can we influence policy and to shift away perhaps from a medical model? That's a, yeah, that's a huge question. I, I feel like it's been a, a lifetime. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, one of the most important things um, I think is, is teaching people about alternatives and, um, and how to start doing them. And that will create, um, you know, like, a bunch of people who are aware that something else is possible, then it becomes more easy to 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 um, turn to policymakers and say, "Hey, look, we're doing this, but we need more support and we need more help." And but it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. If obviously the the policy is to teach people how to do this stuff, then <laughs> more people will know. But so a lot of what my work though has been just trying to just reach whoever I can to get them interested in this and then hope that those shifts as more people become aware that this is possible there's more pressure on the policy people hey why aren't we doing this or 
why why can't we get going um so Thoughts. Absolutely. Also, shameless plug: you could join ISPS US as a member or get engaged in our uh, in our work because this is exactly what we're pushing towards, and we need more folks like you and people who share our values to join our mission. The more of us there are, and the more more work we can do together. Okay. Yeah. End of shameless <laughs> plug. But check out ISPS-US.org to find out more. So, yeah. So just joining as a member helps, but then also we're you know, thinking about volunteering in various ways and, you know, or, yeah, anything you can do that's going to take, a, it's going to take a, a team effort. It's going to take a lot of us working together to make big changes. But every little change can be, you know, like when one person changes and then they help a few other people, that's, that counts, you know, it may not be the big system change we want, but it's, 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 it's important. And it also it does help, I think, move towards that big system change to get, as we get more people doing things that are helpful. I agree. Yeah. We're it's like ripples to get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like our, the, the last question that we had uh, is also about um changing changing um policies and shifting from, from that model. So I think that you've probably covered that already, Ron. So it looks like we're, we're out of questions, but they have been wonderful, thoughtful questions. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Ron, for sharing your expertise and experience. Did you have any final comments for our participants? Yeah, I just hope you find a way to use some of what we talked about to go out and do some helpful things. And it's a pleasure to be able to share some ideas Wonderful. with you. All right, and we'll get the recording and materials out um, uh, as soon as we can. I would definitely think they'd be out by early next week. All right. Bye, goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye.